The broadcast of the regular meeting of the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee for today, which is September 22nd. I'm Lisa Goodman. I'm the chair of the committee. As we begin, I'll note for the record that this meeting has remote participation from members of the City Council as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13 d point. 021 due to the local public health emergency. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this committee. Councilmember Reich? Gordon? Osman? Here. Ellison? Present. Schrader? Here. Chair Goodman? Present. There are four members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. The consent agenda is the first item of business for today. There are 10 items on the agenda. Item number 10 are the liquor license approvals and 11 are the gambling license approvals. Item number 12 is going to be postponed. This is with regard to a licensed settlement conference at Greenway Liquor at 105 Grant Street West. Item number 13 is local approval of a special law regarding liquor licenses for the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden, Boom Island Park, and the Downtown Commons Park. Item number 14 is the extension of the maturity date for two affordable housing loans uh, that are uh, part of a subordinated debt. This is for the Olydia Apartments Project. Item number 15 are contract amendments for many eligible providers for employment and training services. I'll just note they are with American Indian OIC, uh, Avivo, uh, Clues, Eastside Neighborhood Services, Emerge Community Development, Goodwill Easter Seals, Hired, Jewish Family and Children's Services, and Minnesota Department of Economic Development, which is DEED, Pillsbury United Communities, Project for Pride and Living, Southeast Asian Refugee Committee, and the Twin Cities Urban League. Uh, these are all under item number 15. Item 16 is authorizing the issuance of uh, bonds for children's health care. Item number 17 is a correction and a vacation at 336 2nd Street, 2nd Street Northeast. Item number 18 is setting a public hearing for a redevelopment plan at 1925 Nicollet Avenue. Item number 19 is the 2020 Consolidated Plan Amendment. Uh, this has to do with um, including homeless shelters as an allowable use. And item number 20 is referring the subject matter of emergency, of emergency shelters to staff to discuss allowing these in industrial districts. Are there any discussion items or items on the consent agenda that anyone would like to pull off for further discussion? And if you do, um, you can note that in the chat, members of the committee. Seeing none, I'll move approval of the consent agenda and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Gordon. Here, aye. Osman. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Here are five ayes. Those items carry and the consent agenda is approved. Now we'll move to our public hearing agenda. There are eight items on that agenda. We'll start with a report from staff on item number one, which is an on-sale liquor with Sunday sales license for Gio Kaku, which is at 3025 Lindale Avenue in the 8th Ward. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm Enrique Velazquez, Manager of Licenses and Consumer Services, presenting an application for KCL DAFA Inc. doing business as Kaku, Minnesota, located at 3025 Lindale Avenue South in Ward 8. This report was prepared by Inspector Phil Cottrell. Kaku, Minnesota has had an on-sale liquor with Sunday license with no live entertainment at this location since July of 2020. The applicant is requesting a permanent expansion of premises for 16 seats for the patio area located on private property adjacent to the building. If approved, they intend to offer food and alcohol at that patio. The proposed hours of operation are Monday through Thursday, 1130 a.m. to midnight, 
Friday and Saturday from 11.30 a.m. to 1 a.m., and then Sunday from 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. Notices of the public hearing were sent on August 31st to residents and property owners within 300 feet of the premises. They were sent to the Lindale Neighborhood Association, the Lind Lake Business Association, and to Council Vice President Jenkins. We've received one response from the public so far, and this uh, respondent supported the permanent expansion. A review of 311 cases and police calls found no significant issues attributable to this business. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommend approval of a permanent expansion of premises. This concludes my report, and at this time I'll stand for any comments or questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Velasquez? Seeing none, I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing and ask the clerk if there are any speakers in queue on this item. Uh, there are no speakers on item one. Um, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, given that there are no speakers, I will close the public hearing and ask if there are any questions or comments from members of the committee. If not, I'll call on Council Member Ellison for a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I will move approval of this item. Approval of item number one has been moved. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich? Gordon? Aye. Osman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Schrader? Aye. Chair Goodman? Aye. There are five ayes. That motion carries and is approved. We'll move on to item number two, which is Barry Sweet Kitchen at 5406 34th Avenue South in the beautiful 11th Ward. Mr. Velasquez. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, Enrique Velasquez, Manager of Licenses and Consumer Services, presenting an application from Barry Sweet Kitchen, Inc., doing business as Barry Sweet Kitchen, located at 5406 34th Avenue South in Ward 11. This report was prepared by Inspector Lisa Schmiller. The applicant is requesting an on-sale liquor license with Sunday sales, no live entertainment. If approved, they intend to add alcohol, uh, alcoholic drinks to the menu, expand its full service restaurant into the adjacent space with additional seating outside on a private patio. The hours of operation are interior and exterior, 8 a.m. to uh, midnight, Tuesday through Sunday, and closed on Mondays. On August 31st, 140 public hearing notices were sent to property owners within 600 feet of the premises to the Nokomis East Neighborhood Organization, Nokomis East Business Association, and to Councilmember Schrader. We've received four responses from the public so far. Three are in support, and one um, demonstrated concerns about availability of parking and the late hour of operation in close proximity to the neighborhood. I will note that the establishment does offer on-premise parking in the adjoining parking lot. And also as part of their proposal, there will be no amplified sound in the outdoor space. A review of 311 cases and police calls found no significant issues attributable to this business. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of an on-sale liquor license with Sunday sales, no live entertainment. This concludes my report, and at this time I will stand for any comments or questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Velasquez? Seeing none, I'm going to open the public hearing. I understand that Mr. Rood is on the phone, and so I would invite him to speak now while the public hearing is open. I'm here. Fantastic. Feel free to give your name and address for the record and uh, tell us a little bit about your business. Um, 5406 34th Avenue South, Minneapolis. Um, we're a, a family style breakfast and lunch restaurant. Um, we're looking to add dinner to our menu and uh, we would like to accompany alcohol drinks with our dinner. Anything else That's you'd there. like? <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add? Um, just uh, wanted to let everybody know that we're going to be responsible and we're going to you know, we're going to make sure everything goes smooth on this. Fantastic. Thank you for your testimony. I'll ask the clerk if there's anyone else to testify on this issue. Uh, no further speakers registered for item two. 
Thank you, Madam Clerk. Seeing there's no further speakers, I'll close the public hearing and see if there are any comments or questions. If not, I will call on Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, am excited uh, to move this forward and expand the expansion. I think they, uh, Jonathan was a little shy on saying, but I mean, it's a fantastic establishment. Uh, it's beloved in the community and uh, excited to see what they do next. And Council Member Schrader's motion, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Osman. Aye. Ellison. Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. And Councilmember Ellison. Aye. There are six ayes. Thank you. That carries and the motion is approved. We'll move then to item number three, uh, which is the commercial property sale ordinance. And I believe Mr. Hansen is giving this report. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Eric Hansen. I am the Director of Economic Policy and Development for the city. And before you is the public hearing portion of the ordinance process that was started in June by council members Cano and Gordon to introduce new language into the Minneapolis Court of Ordinance for notification of commercial property sale. Next slide, please. This ordinance uh, requires, if passed, will require property owners um, to give notice when they are um, going to sell their property uh, to the city so that um, uh, so that we are understand all of the properties that are being sold uh, within uh, the city of Minneapolis. This applies to properties that are commercially zoned or industrial zoned and exclude those that are on 1031 exchanges or an ex fair exchange of, of similar properties, um, which would be not subject to this ordinance. Property owners would be required to submit to the city uh, a notice uh, that they are getting prepared to sell. And there's a number of, of um, um, conditions that they'd have to meet in order to send it into the city and then we would report back and the reason we are doing this is it allows for more transparency in the commercial real estate process and it facilitates opportunities for us as a community uh, to find community ownership uh, opportunities and if you can move to the next slide please this map shows the areas of the city that um, would would require uh, the notice of sale. All, all the properties in the gray, the red, and the orange that are commercial would have um, this requirement. And with that, uh, it, um, after the public hearing, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, Mr. Hansen, I have a question right now, so maybe you can answer this. Sure. Um, I received two calls this morning from community owners of buildings in my ward that didn't know anything about this. And since I was the author of advanced notice for affordable housing, we did three years of outreach with apartment owners on this. How come no one knows about this? There's no one on the public hearing. Two people reached out after seeing the agenda. What was the community participation to people who own these buildings? Many of them are members of the community. Others might not be. Um, I would refer back to the, the authors of the ordinance. Um, we have, we were, um, it was introduced back in June. I have to look into the, the community engagement that was done uh, for this ordinance process. Okay, I see Council Member Gordon is one of the authors has uh, signed on. So Council Member Gordon. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. I will admit that um, we probably didn't take as much time as we could have because part of this is in response to all the damaged properties from the civil unrest. So we were trying to um, pivot so that we had some opportunity because there is a fear and what we heard from the community. And I, I'll say that areas that I did most of the engagement was along Lake Street with the Lake Street Council, Longfellow Business Association, um, other uh, groups who would come to those meetings and the neighborhood. So I will admit that it wasn't focused citywide and we could have done a broader effort at that. Um, but we certainly did have discussions and this idea was um, brought up and supported by many people at those meetings just so that we all could get notification when a sale is coming so there'd at least be an opportunity to prevent the kind of um, 
I guess, displacement that we feared might happen. Um, so far, there hasn't been a mass uh, sale of property, so I, I'm not saying that the biggest fears haven't necessarily been realized. I also got some of those notes a little bit um, recently, in fact, today. So um, clearly some people weren't noticing when it was introduced and those other things, but they're noticing coming forward now. I've offered to meet with everybody who's contacted me about it so we can discuss more about it. And my plan actually is to make sure to have those meetings next week um, before this goes to the council. So Councilmember Gordon, so essentially there's been no community engagement amongst most people and there's been some community engagement amongst those that have been victims of the civil unrest. How do I explain to my constituents where there's been no community engagement, how I would vote on something that they didn't even know about? So I'm not sure what most actually means. So and this is what what I did. And there's a lot of properties on Lake Street and in Seward and in the second ward and in Southeast that are commercial and industrial. But um, I think you could. Um, I mean, maybe we want to take some more time with this and do some more engagement. So I'm open to those things. And I and I know that um, uh, Council Member Cano probably did engagement of her, of her own and reaching out and talking to um, folks about it as well. So are you open to postponing this until there's a broader discussion? I don't necessarily object. I'm very familiar with advance notice, but I mean, I'm alarmed that a number of businesses along South Hennepin reached out, their community owners actually, they live in East Isles, they own businesses in East Isles and the property and they had no idea. I think that's alarming that we would tell them they have to do this without any engagement at all. And I feel like that goes against everything we say about community engagement. Is there a way to bifurcate this so we can say we can move forward with properties that were, um, you know, victims of uh, civil unrest because of that concern without getting everybody else dragged into it for now? Is there a city attorney's opinion on that? We looked at that option and I think that's something we wanted to, um, in fact, just yesterday, um, Council Member Cano and I were talking about it. And that is a position that I think we um, would be open to is is narrowing it down. And we certainly talked about that with staff. I think there was even a, a draft language that was trying to focus in on these properties, which are also quite a few, um, as you've seen the maps of those properties that were damaged. But um, um, yeah, we're open to that. Um, and I could certainly um, consider if we needed to delay it further. You can understand there still is a sense of urgency unless we're moving forward with this. So there might be interest in why don't we move forward with um, some of the properties we're more concerned about right now and take a little more time to do it citywide. I could, I, I'm certainly open to that and would love to hear from other committee members and my colleagues as well. Is there anyone else on the committee who wants to weigh in before we open the public hearing? I'll note that there are no people registered for this public hearing, which is in and of itself a concern. <laughs> because they didn't even know how to reach out in the public hearing, and that feels very sloppy to me. Councilmember Schrader. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman. I, I, I want to echo a lot of your comments as, as the other author uh, of, of advanced notice of sale. I, I attended a meeting with uh, Councilmember Cano and Councilmember Goodman, or Councilmember Gordon, um, where the, the idea of using the map that uh, CPED did of damaged properties from the uprising would be used as uh, used as kind of a first bout. I, I, I completely agree with the need to act quickly in those areas. Um, and I like Councilmember Gordon's suggestion of maybe doing this, you know, in a bifurcated way. Is there a way to do to really address the the emergency need and at the same time talk, uh, do the, the outreach that we've done in every other ordinance for something citywide? Um, I think that was that was my suggestion uh, before. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it also tells the story like if we're um, if this really is an emergency need, we need we need to be able to, to show that to the public, especially because this is going rather fast for the city. Um, but also, I think I, I would have other questions, the, the same questions that, um, you know, we got on advance notice. You know, who is this going to apply to? What's this? How is this going to be handled by staff? How, how much? Uh, resources will this take up? Because we, we received a lot of great info from staff. We received, received a lot of pushback on advance notice for, for affordable housing, uh, which is a huge, huge need. Um, and we were able to work something out, but that, that took time. And so I, I think that dividing it up would make a lot of sense to make sure that we're getting that urgent need. Um, but also I agree that there needs to be a, a more outreach to stakeholders. Council Member Gordon. 
I appreciate that. I also want to say I appreciate all the work that both of you did on advance notice of sale for residential because it's certainly what we um, model this app after. Um, and uh, you know, um, Mr. Hansen can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe there was some interest in narrowing it because of the workload. And I believe that the attorneys were open and, and felt like we could, um, there was a basis to do it either way. But we'll go back and have those discussions again too. So we don't necessarily, um, if Mr. Hansen doesn't want to answer now or have a lot of details uh, and doesn't want to talk about the background attorney's opinions, that's fine. I understand that. But um, we will look at that. This was a, um, as I said before, a discussed kind of a alternative position that we would, um, were interested in taking as well. So. Um, I'll take your advisement into consideration and um, we'll see what we can um, develop before the council meeting with um, presumably some significant amendments narrowing the number of properties involved to those that were damaged in the civil unrest. Okay, then um, given the discussion we've heard so far, I, I do need to open and close the public hearing. Council Member Gordon, in an effort not to postpone the important work of the areas with regard to civil unrest, I think we could move it forward without recommendation. And that would give you an opportunity to bifurcate it and figure out what we could do by the council meeting so that we don't slow down that important work while getting everyone caught up in it that didn't know anything about it in without objection. If there's an objection, we can postpone the entire thing. But I hear you saying you want to move forward on some of these properties sooner. Yeah, I would make that motion, I guess, after the public hearing. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else on the committee who would like to comment prior to opening the public hearing? Seeing none, I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing and ask the clerk if there are any speakers in queue. Uh, no speakers in queue for item three. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Seeing no speakers, I'll close the public hearing and I will move this item forward without recommendation uh, with the intent to be to um, do as exactly as the authors have suggested, which is move forward something that will help uh, the businesses located in some of these properties that have been identified by staff as based on civil unrest and checking in with other council members where civil unrest didn't only happen in one or two wards and then also uh, keep to keep it moving within this cycle. Um, so are there comments or questions about that motion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Osman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Schrader? Aye. Chair Goodman? Aye. There are six ayes. That item has moved forward without recommendation. We'll now move on to public hearing item number four. We have a series of public hearing land sales. Uh, this is a land sale at 3648 Columbus Avenue, and I will call on Mr. Ramadan to give this report. Good afternoon, Chair Gordon, members of the Goodman, I, I, I'll get this right. Goodman, members of the committee. Uh, uh, we have 3648 Columbus Avenue. The sale is uh, a side yard. The policies for the program were established by the City Council on January 15, 2016. The staff recommends the side yard sale of 3648 Columbus Avenue to Catherine A. Cooney for its praise value of $3,600 subject to conditions. On February 16, 2001, the City of Minneapolis Department of Public Works acquired this parcel from a private owner through eminent domain as part of the Columbus Flood Control Project. The portion of the parcel was used for right-of-way construction resulting in this non-buildable uh, status. The Public Works Department no longer needing this property for municipal purposes transferred the property to CPED. The property is adjacent to another owned by, by the purchaser at 1737th Street East. This is the only application received and the property is an irregular parcel approximately 4,480 square feet. The purchaser would combine the unbuildable vacant land with their adjacent um, the combined parcel would be approximately 264 square feet. Notification was provided to the can-do neighborhood of the staff intent to sell the property for a combination with the adjacent property. The purchaser, Catherine Cooney, uh, was notified, and I believe that she's in queue uh, for the public hearing today, but are there questions from are there any questions for Mr. Ramadan on item number four? Seeing none, thank you for your report, Mr. Ramadan. I'm going to open the public hearing and ask Ms. Cooney if she would like to say a few words with regard to this land sale. Please press star six to speak.
We'll see if Catherine Cooney is on the line, and if you are, you might have to unmute your phone and push star six to be able to speak. I'll ask the clerk if it looks like she's still on the line. Uh, Ms. Cooney is still on the line. I think there's just a technical difficulty. That's OK. I have those all the time. <laughs> I'm can very. Now? Yes, we can, Ms. Cooney. Thank oh, you for thank being you. here. Thank you. It wasn't it was muting me and unmuting me. Um, this is Catherine Cooney and um, I my husband and I have lived at 710 East 37th Street um, for more than 40 years. And um, when we were part of the um, neighborhood that designed the uh, the flood project here, so we have been um, taking care of and and um, um, really appreciating having that piece of land next to us for a long time, and have been interested in acquiring it. Um, my plans are to provide, if I can, off street parking for the house at 710 and garden and. Um, just generally make a good, very good piece of property out of it. Thank you so much for being on the call today and for your testimony. Sure. I'll, ask, I'll ask the clerk if there's anyone else here for the public hearing. No further speakers on item four. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Given that there are no further speakers, I'll close the public hearing and see if there are any comments or questions from members of the committee. If not, I'll call on Council Member Schrader to make a motion. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman. I'd like to move this item forward. This item has been moved by Council Member Schrader. Are there further comments or questions? Council Member Reich? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Osman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Schrader? Aye. Chair Goodman? Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. We'll now move on to item number five, which is a land sale at 2034 James Avenue North. And I'll call on Mr. Ramadan for our report. Thank you, Chair Goodman. Uh, uh, again, I sale through Minneapolis Homes. The policies for the program were established by the City Council on December 11, 2015, and again on February 10, 2017. The staff recommends the sale of 2034 James Avenue North to M2 Progression Development LLC for its appraised value of $5,100 subject to conditions. 2034 James was acquired on January 15, 2016 from Greater Metropolitan Housing Corporation. The staff has continuously marketed this property on the website to 1,000 people. And this is the only application received. The purchaser intends to invest $525,000 triplex with 1,600 square feet uh, square feet per unit. Each unit will have a three bedrooms and two bathrooms and one stall in a detached three car garage. Uh, CPES construction management staff reviewed the plans and estimates submitted by the applicants and confirmed that they are sufficient to meet the minimum new construction standards. Notification was provided to the Jordan Area Community Council, but the neighborhood did not respond. The developer uh, into progression represented by Greg Shaw and Mike Merrill uh, register for the public hearing today, and I believe they are uh, in queue. Are there any questions for me? Are there any questions for Mr. Ramadan on item number five? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing and call on Mr. Merrill or Mr. Shaw in either order uh, to be welcome to testify. Please press star six to unmute. Hey, good afternoon. This is Mike Merrill. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your meeting today, and thanks for the opportunity to develop and enhance the communities within the Northern Corridor of Minneapolis. Uh, we build homes that are affordable, aesthetically pleasing, and encompassing uh, affordable lending options. And we pride ourselves on ownership individuals and families alike. Uh, my name is Mike Merrill. I'm a partner, Greg Shaw, who's on the line as well. And uh, he'll be here to introduce himself. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Mr. Shaw, would you like to say a few words? Yes. Thank you, uh, City Council and respective members for allowing us to join this meeting today. Um, in addition to what Mike uh, said and communicated, we are a real estate development company with a combined experience level of 17 years of success and development experience, specializing in revitalization of communities and closing the home ownership gap and providing housing 
that not that is not only obtainable but affordable. We have a wealth of knowledge and experience with affordable housing sectors. However, we are developers that are striving to create a paradigm shift and move away from the negative connotations of affordable housing programs. Our sole desire is to revitalize a community and offer housing that is truly affordable, offer affordable lending options to purchase, and most important, educate, equip, and empower people within the community to obtain home ownership for both individuals and families alike. And we have a model, Mike. Well, basically, our mantra is this here, what is enough? And we desire to build homes that provide a value for social equity and home equity. We build homes, uh, when a home buyer purchases a home from into progressive development, uh, we want to ensure that the uh, buyer receives the keys to home ownership with built-in equity. We want to pay it for and share the equity pool. No need to sell the top dollar with the market rate price. Make our homes affordable and attraction and an attractive option. And we would like to be a part of the housing deficit, de deficit, I'm sorry, deficit solution and make the city of Minneapolis proud of what we do as we build and create affordable home ownership, one home at a time for individuals and families. Thank you again for this amazing opportunity. We look forward to a long and successful relationship with the city of Minneapolis. Any questions for us? Thank you, Mr. Shaw and Mr. Merrill. I note that you are uh, the staff recommendation on items number five, six, and seven. So I will take your testimony uh, overall as asking for our support on all three of those items, but we will have to take them all individually. So I just wanted to let you know that. Are there any questions uh, from members of the committee? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk if there are any additional people signed up to testify on the land sale. Uh, no additional speakers on five on item five. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. I will then close the public hearing and ask Council Member Ellison for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm happy to move approval. On Council Member Ellison's motion to approve the land sale at 2034 James Avenue North, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Wright. Aye. Gordon? Aye. Hoffman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Schrader? Aye. Chair Goodman? Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. We'll now move on to land sale number six, which is a sale at 2038 James Avenue North, also to Mr. Merrill and Mr. Shaw. I'll ask Mr. Ramadan to please give his report. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman. Uh, 2038 James Avenue North, uh, we are recommending for sale to M2 Progression Development LLC for its appraised value of $5,100 subject to conditions. Uh, this property was also acquired on January 15, 2016 from Greater Metro Metropolitan Housing Corporation. Um, again, this was the only application received. This would be another triplex at $525,000 of 1,600 square finished square feet per unit. Um, and again, we did reach out to the Jordan neighborhood and but not did not get a response. And as you've already heard from Mr. Merrill and Mr. Shaw, they are available for questions today. Are there any questions for me? Are there any questions for Mr. Ramadan on item number six? Seeing none, I'm going to open the public hearing on item number six, which is a land sale at 2038 James Avenue North to Mr. Merrill and Mr. Shaw, who have previously spoken, but are welcome to say something else if they have anything else to add. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and uh, call on Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, I'm happy to move forward. Approval has been moved for item number six. I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Wright. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Osman. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. Those item that item is approved. We'll then move on to item number seven, which is also a land sale. 
Mr. Ramadan, welcome back. Thank you, Chair Goodman. Um, 2028, uh, which is a, the adjacent property to the other two, uh, we are recommending for sale to M2 Progression Development for its appraised value of $5,600 subject to conditions. This property was actually acquired on October 23rd, 2007 from jo Deutsche National a Bank Trust. Uh, there was a dilapidated structure on the property which had to be demolished. Afterwards, we marketed it to well over 3,000 people. Uh, again, this was another triplex at five thousand two hundred twenty-five thousand, excuse me, five five hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars to um, for a sixteen hundred finished square feet uh, per unit. Um, we did again reach out to the Jordan Community Council, but did not get a response, and uh, we're recommending for sale again to M2 Progression. Mr. Greg Shaw, and Mr. Mike Merrill are registered for the public hearing today. Are there any questions for me? Are there any questions for Mr. Ramadan? on this land sale. Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk. Uh, well, the clerk has noted that Mr. Merrill and Mr. Shaw are here in case anyone has any questions or they would like to testify as the public hearing is now open. Mr. Merrill or Shaw, do you have anything to add? Seeing that you don't, I just personally want to thank you on behalf of the council for the really good work that you are going to be doing in this neighborhood. Um, and we're just very glad that you stepped forward to take on these three properties and thank Mr. Ramadan for his good work. Uh, with that, I'll close the public hearing and call on Council Member Ellison. Madam Chair, thank you. I'm happy to move approval. Approval has been moved of item number seven, which is a land sale at 2028 James Avenue North. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Osman. Aye. Allison. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There's six ayes. Thank you uh, to the clerk. That motion is approved. We'll then move on to our last land sale of the day, which is land sale and development terms at Baldwin Square, 4140-4146 Fremont Avenue North. And I'll call on Emily Stern to give a staff report. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman, committee members. I'm Emily Stern with CPAD Business Development. I'm here before you today to request your approval of the land sale development terms and a commercial property development fund loan for the redevelopment of a city owned property at 4140 through 4146 Fremont Avenue North into a multi-tenant retail and office space. The property consists of two city owned buildings on one parcel and is located near the southeast corner of 42nd Avenue North and Fremont Avenue North. The city acquired the property in 2015 out of tax forfeiture and has since been working uh, to reactivate the buildings. In November of 2016, the city issued a request for proposals for the property and from the RFP process, the city granted exclusive devel development rights for the property to Ideal Gr Development Group, LLC. IDG is owned by Jamil Ford, who is president of Mobilized Design and Architecture located in North Minneapolis. IDG's plans for the site include a multi-tenant commercial uh, space with a restaurant, bookstore and cafe on the ground level, event space in an art gallery in the basement, and office spaces on the second floor. The project is named Baldwin Square after the African-American writer James Baldwin. Camille Ford and two other investors comprise Baldwin Square Group LLC, the entity that will purchase and own the, re the Fremont real estate that will be developed by IDG. IDG is currently in negotiations with Busboys and Poets to be the restaurant and retail tenant. Bus Boys and Poets is a well-established, uh, successful restaurant chain that, it, that operates in the Washington, D.C. area and currently has seven locations there. Bus Boys and Poets would lease the entire first floor and basement and operate the restaurant and related coffee shop, bookstore, art gallery, and event center. Restaurant Bus Boys and Poets has the potential to be, become a regional destination at this location and a cultural hub attracting customers from all over the, the area or all over the Twin Cities metro area to come for the food, entertainment and special events. In terms of the office space, the Neighborhood Development Center it has, uh, has committed to be the second floor tenant. From these offices, NDC would advise North Minneapolis entrepreneurs and provide supportive services and space to other businesses. 
Other plant tenants in the space include the architecture firms Mobilize Design and Andrew McGlory Associates. The total project cost is estimated at approximately 3.5 million and detailed sources and uses of the funds are summarized in the staff report if, if anyone wants more detail. As part of this action, staff is requesting council authorization to sell the property to Baldwin Square for $1 which is deemed to be the fair reuse value due to the amount of work needed to bring the existing buildings up to code. The project will be financed through a combination of funders. BSG is working with Sunrise Banks on senior debt financing using New Markets tax credits. Hennepin County is currently reviewing a uh, transit oriented development grant application for the project and IDG is in the process of applying for a Met Council grant in the current application round to pay for removal of asbestos and lead based paint in the existing buildings. The pending public and, and bank sources are, expe are expected to be finalized in the coming months prior to closing. BSG has requested city financial support for this project in the form of a $750,000 loan from the city's uh, new commercial property development fund to help finance the project's renovation and construction. The terms of this loan would align with the approved guidelines for the CPDF program, namely a 40 year term at 0% interest forgivable at the end of the term with some of standard restrictions. As part of this action, staff is requesting council approval of this loan. As the final part of this action, staff requests council approval of the term sheet that is included with the staff report as a basis for the redevelopment contract with the developer. Thank you for your time and your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions and both Jamil Ford and Andrew McGlory are on the call today from the development team and can elaborate on any project details and answer uh, additional questions that committee members may have. Thank you, Ms. Stern, for your report. We'll see if there are any questions for you prior to opening the public hearing. Are there any questions for Ms. Stern? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing on item number eight, which is a land sale, a term sheet agreement, as well as approving the commercial property development fund loan. I will open the public hearing and see if Mr. Ford or Mr. McGlory have anything they'd like to add. Please unmute your phone and press star six. Everyone. This is Jamil Ford with Ideal Development Group. Um, I would just like to send my thanks to all of the staff, city council members and the mayor's office for full support on this project and thank everybody for their interest and support along the way over the last three to four years. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Mr. McGlory, did you want to add something? Yes, I do. Please go ahead. Do you hear me? We can, sir. Hello? OK, Mr. McGlory, we my can hear you. Andrew. Yes, my name is Andrew McGlory. And I just, I think Emily and Jamil said, said everything, but I just want to add that we have been committed from day one to have community engagement. And we feel very good about the fact that we have truly kept the community address, and they are 100% behind this development. And that was our original intent. We wanted to exceed not only the city expectation, but also the uh, Webster River Camden Neighborhood Association expectation. So we again, I'd like to uh, thank everyone like Jamil has said, and that uh, that's it. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'll ask the clerk if there are any additional speakers on this item. No additional speakers for item eight. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and see if anyone uh, would like to speak or make a motion. Seeing none, I'm going to move approval of the staff recommendation. I um, have known Mr. Ford for quite a long time and I really want to use the word proud to describe the fact that you and your partners are at this point. 
there has been a lot of work by a lot of people, but then again, it takes a village to take a property and make something really incredible out of it. I know Mr. Hansen, Ms. Stern, as well as many CPED staff and your entire team have worked really hard to get to this point. I'm just really proud to know you all and really excited about what you're going to have the opportunity to do for our city. And I'll go ahead and call on Council Member Ellison to make the motion. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I was a little uh, slow on the draw, but you basically took the words right out of my mouth. I, I think that this project is is really awesome and, and needed. And even though it's not in my ward, uh, you know, the north side is uh, definitely a community and and not split by some arbitrary boundary. Uh, and so I look I look forward to um, you all completing this project, and I'm happy to move approval of this land sale. On Council Member Ellison's motion to approve, are there any further comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Hoffman? Aye. Allison? Aye. Schrader? Aye. Chair Goodman? Aye. There are six ayes. That item is approved. Lastly, we'll handle the quasi-judicial public hearing that's on our agenda. The quasi-judicial public hearing is a minor subdivision as well as variances that have been appealed by Catherine Lang. Um, I want to ask staff to give a presentation. Ms. Silas, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, committee members. Chair Goodman. So the site in question is 3908 Abbott Avenue South. Um, this is located in the R1 multiple family district um, and the site is 10,698 square feet in size. Uh, it's currently occupied by a one story single family home that occupies most of the site. The applicant has proposed to subdivide the existing site into two new parcels, demolish the home on um, the site and construct either one or two family dwellings on each site. Um, with the, the new triplex uh, regulations, they would be permitted to construct up to a triplex on each site, um, though the applicant has indicated more of an interest in one or two family structures. Um, and I'll stay on this page for just one moment so you can kind of take a look at the other lot sizes in the area. Um, there are parts, especially of Southwest Minneapolis, that qualify for the large lot provision. This area, this specific area is not one of them. Um, there is a lot of variation in sizes of lots, um, even on this, uh, you know, the, the shared block between Beard and Abbott. The properties facing Abbott do tend to be larger, while the properties facing Beard are smaller. Next slide, please. In the R1 district, the minimum lot area requirement is 6,000 square feet and the minimum lot width is 50 feet. Um, so the applicant has proposed two properties that uh, would be smaller uh, than those requirements. So it would be uh, 5,350 square feet uh, for parcel one and 5,348 square feet for parcel two, and they would each be 42.5 feet in width. Um, so the project did require the two variances to reduce the minimum lot area and lot width for each parcel, along with the minor subdivision. Next slide. Um, and here's an aerial view just showing this block and the surrounding context. Next slide. Now here's the um, the minor uh, subdivision survey showing the underlying platted lots. Um, in this case, the the, uh, the parcel was created by the combination of one uh, entire under underlying platted lot and portions of two other lots. Next slide. So the applicant has sketched out um, the possible footprint of a new single family home or duplex that could be put on the site. Um, it is worth noting that in the R1 district, there is a uh, the, the 6,000 square foot and 50 foot width uh, requirements for individual lots is um, larger than in the R1A district. Uh, so the actual proposed lot size here of uh, uh, 50, over 5,300 square feet and over um, and 42 and a half feet in width is actually a very standard lot when looking at um, 
the majority of residential zoning districts in the city. So there shouldn't be any um, complications with building on these lots. They will be buildable um, without other variances. Next slide. Um, and so the applicant has submitted uh, just a, a brief uh, sketch of the site plan for a duplex that could fit on these on each of these lots. Next slide. And here's a rendering of a, a duplex that may fit. I, I think at this point, the, none of these are set in stone. Um, any proposed duplex or single family home would have to go through the administrative site plan review process, but the applicant did submit some of these sketches to get an, give an idea of um, what they're thinking for the future of the site. Next slide. Um, here's a picture of the single family home that's on the site now. So it is a one story Rambler style single family home with an attached front facing garage. Next slide. Oh, I'm not sure how that got in there. <laughs> Next slide. This is not the project. OK, so uh, for the variances, staff did find a practical difficulty with the orientation of the underlying platted lots. Um, this is an area where, you know, there are um, there are properties that comply with the underlying platted lots that are non-conforming to the zoning district. This property was created by the combination of three underlying platted lots that were the smaller size than what's required in the zoning district. There's not a clear uh, line down the middle where it, 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 it clearly was two platted lots where um, it might make sense to, to be able to do, a, you know, a, administrative lot split. Staff did find that that constituted a practical difficulty. Um, as noted, because these, uh, if this was a different zoning district, these would be standard size lots. There's no um, complications in terms of buildable area for the sites. Uh, they would not need additional variances for development, um, and the proposal would be um, reasonable in that in that context. Um, in addition, staff has recommended uh, conditions of a condition of approval that the attached or that the curb cut be removed. The site is served by an alley, though it does have um, a double garage uh, with a front facing curb cut. Um, and so that would be removed and access would occur via the alley um, if approved. And uh, staff finds that the proposal is consistent with the Minneapolis 2040 plan in that it allows for incremental housing density um, by dividing this large lot into two uh, lots suitable for development of single two or three family homes. Um, next slide. And I am happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions, Ms. Silas, on this item? Seeing none, uh, Councilmember Gordon. Thank you, and maybe um, we can have this discussion too after the hearing, but I'm trying to zero in on the practical difficulty, and it seems like you talked about the orientation of the underlying flat lines, but it seems like the practical difficulty is that it's not um, 6,000 square feet. It, isn't it, it doesn't it need the variance because it's not large enough for two, Two, two lots? Correct. However, you know, this is an area where there are a lot of um, properties that retain the original platting and therefore they are non-conforming to the size. Um, staff just found that because this parcel was created by the combination of multiple pieces of lots, um, that that did create a practical difficulty in meeting that minimum size requirement. which must happen a lot when somebody gets a side yard because we sell people side yards. And so all of a sudden there's, it's a little bigger than one lot. Um, it seems like, so, so then they can make the claim that, oh, look, um, I'm, I'm only 5,000 because I got this side yard, but now I want to have two houses on my space. Um, I'll get, I'll just go claim that's a hardship. So the hardship is they didn't get big enough pieces added to their original property. Um, that is the the finding that staff made in this case. Yes. Okay. That. Um. I'm not, all right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Gordon. Um. I am. Are there any other questions? 
Uh, seeing none, I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing. With this kind of hearing, we give the appellant an opportunity to make their case first. I know Catherine Lang is the uh, applicant, is Ms. Lang or her uh, representative on the phone. And if you are, please unmute your phone and press star six. I'll give you a couple of minutes to make your presentation. Hi, this is Catherine Lang. Can you hear me? We can, Ms. Lang. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm speaking on behalf of multiple neighbors to appeal the decision by the Minneapolis Planning Commission regarding 3908 Abbott Avenue South. The applicant of 3908 Abbott Avenue South requested to split the lot into two smaller than code lots in the spirit of the 2040 plan and the pra practical difficulty listed with historical plotting. Um, we do not believe that this is a unique circumstance or an appropriate practical difficulty to justify the variances. Um, and in fact, splitting these lots would create two outliers on that in terms of plots on that block. Um, we feel that uh, this should not be approved and we appreciate the opportunity to appeal. So the Thanks. purpose of... Sorry, I, I had some more. <laughs> the, the purpose of the spirit and spirit of the Minneapolis 2040 plan was not to enrich large lot owners in Minneapolis who wish to divide their lots into smaller than code lots and build structures for economic gain at the expense of the environment and surrounding neighborhood. The applicant submitted plans for luxury duplexes, which are likely to provide significant economic gain and do not outweigh the negative impacts to the neighborhood. Um, he did not conduct community outreach to impacted neighbors, and we are not sure that he followed all notification requirements. Um, at the Planning Commission hearing, he indicated that all neighbors were aware of and approved of this project, which was false. Um, we are specifically objecting because after looking back at the City of Minneapolis Planning Commission annual reports, we see that all requests for minor subdivisions have been approved over the last four years. And we're concerned that this is creating a precedent for smaller and smaller lots without adequate practical difficulty justification at the expense of adhering to zoning code and regulations. Um, we feel that by approving these minor subdivisions one at a time, the City Planning Commission is creating a precedent to approve additional minor subdivisions because it did so previously without formally addressing a change in lot size minimums through formal City Council process. Um, it's also creating a precedent and economic incentive for city residents with large lots to split their lots and sell to builders or build themselves to leverage their land for personal economic gain. This proposed variance will alter the essential character of the locality and be injurious to the use and enjoyment of the other property in the vicinity. Um, it will significantly change the tree coverage in the area. Um, it's in the application and in the hearing, the applicant indicated that this lot is located within close proximity to a bus line, which is part of the rationale for the justification. But this bus route is being relocated from the 39th Street corridor to the 44th Street corridor, so that argument does not seem valid. And without additional infrastructure commitment by the city, existing infrastructure surrounding the applicant's property is likely inadequate when you replace a single family home with two multiple family homes uh, it will further erode a crumbling alley, reduce tree cover, dramatically increase the number of trash cans and space required to house them, and result in additional parked cars because of the significant or the lack of proposed garage parking in the duplexes. So we feel there's no reason to grant exceptions to existing codes and regulations just for economic benefit alone. And moreover, the destruction of this quality single floor, single floor home will decrease desirable housing for older people who wish to age in place or for disabled purchasers. So we don't feel that this is the only appropriate use of this land and subdivision solely benefits the applicant at the expense of the community. Again, without adequate, unique, practical difficulty demonstrated. So we'd like to express our strong objection and we ask that the board uphold current ordinances and reject these alterations. Thank you very much for your time and consideration and letting me speak on behalf of my neighbors. Thank you, Ms. Lang. The second person we have in line is Christopher Lang. Are you here? He does not need to speak. He, I'm working today, so he was the backup in case I wasn't able to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next person in line is Elizabeth Cogswell.
Hello, can you? We can hear you, ma'am. Hello? Hello, we can hear you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I got something from the call center that made it sound like I was disconnected. I appreciate your uh, considering um, our appeal. Um, as uh, Ms. Lang said, the division of this lot um, with no um, negative, uh, without any uh, uh, hardship uh, expressed by the current owner uh, will have a negative impact on the ambiance of the neighbor neighborhood, uh, not only in terms of the uh, foliage, uh, the tree cover in the area, but also and the uh, problem with uh, fewer and fewer single-story houses in this area of Linden Hills for older citizens and the disabled. But also, um, hello? Uh, we can hear you. Okay, it's it's ringing for some reason. Um, that reduces uh, the the diversity of housing in the area, and um, almost all of the new houses that have been built are two or three uh, level homes without elevators. And it also reduces. I, I realize that eventually it is the building uh, site plans that have to be approved. But I think I wanted to state some of the impact on the neighborhood without um, uh, when there is uh, no great hardship on the part of the current owner. Um, the diversity of housing stock in our area is threatened by the trend toward um, houses uh, that are selling of uh, 1 million and above in this area, making it nearly impossible for first-time buyers to live in our part of Linden Hills or in all of Linden Hills. In the very same block as the proposed plan under consideration is a new duplex that is being marketed at $1.29 million per unit plus HOA fees of $500 per month per unit. That uh, pr uh, originally on that lot was a small bungalow that could have been a first-time buyer's home. What young family with young children who could attend our neighborhood schools can possibly purchase such housing? Such in prices encourage owners such as the applicant to seek variances in either lot sizes or building permits in order to reap the financial personal, for personal financial uh, benefits. Um, the uh, we really do have a um, very few um, single level houses or houses available for first time home buyers. Moreover, the upward spiraling of median uh, prices of housing in Linden Hills is having a significant impact on our taxes. Our property, ta property taxes rose over 28% in a single year without any changes to our home or lot. I would also like to um, briefly address the veracity of the applicant's claims about his communication with neighbors mentioned by Ms. Lang. Um, he said that he had gained the approval of, notified and gained the approval of his impacted neighbors, but he did not speak to us. Furthermore, he said that he had gained the approval of the Linden Hills Neighborhood Association, but an association board member has stated that they gave approval based on the signatures of support by his neighbors, but those signatures did not include any of us who are addressing the commission today. They included the signatures of two neighbors across the street from his property that will be impacted only positively by having his driveway onto Abbott removed and the garages opening into the alley instead. I personally Ms. spoke Russell, with a neighbor you, who lives. Can you wrap Hello? up your comments? Can you wrap up your comments, please? Yes, I can. Um, uh, I was going to say that uh, for a neighbor who does not have Wi-Fi access and could not uh, see the plans on the commission's uh, website, the the plans of uh, the applicant were misrepresented 
uh, and he therefore signed uh, um, his approval, uh, having had the situation uh, misrepresented. So I hope that you will deny, uh, reverse your previous approval. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll call on Deborah Fletcher and ask you to keep your comments to two minutes, please. Please press star six to unmute. Yeah, hello, this is Deborah Fletcher. Go ahead, Ms. Fletcher. Oh, okay, Excuse thank you. you. Um, my family home is directly behind, across the alley from uh, the house, the, this uh, property for consideration. I would like to emphasize that the the, the change, uh, any change from the original sizes of the plots was only to the benefit of the homeowner in terms of giving them a larger order, a larger yard, and any uh, any opportunity to divide this into two plots uh, comes from the changes in the zoning codes from develop, Minneapolis, development Minneapolis 2040, uh, the goals of which are, are not uh, enhan the, the, not enhanced by splitting this into two, uh, into four family, four, four dwellings from one. Uh, and in fact, most of them, all of them, I can see the ones that are impacted are moved backwards. Um, I would assume that this is an obviously unintended consequences, uh, consequence of zoning changes. Um, I would feel good about a change if it was part of an evolution to a more just society. If I saw it as the, a contribution of the greater good by the neighbors. But promotion and enabling use of zoning changes for financial gain of one resident or developer at the expense of their neighbor with no resultant benefit for the greater good uh, just makes us chumps or worse encourages us to do the same thing with our property. Um, one assumes they're unintended, but as such approvals seem to have become rubber stamps, it's becoming clear that the Commission is actively permitting these unjust decisions and supports a growing sense that it comes from some sort of resentment bias against citizens of Linden Hills and, and Southwest Minneapolis. My parents bought this house when, when they had three children under the age of 10 and we all lived there, grew up there. My 96 year old mother is still there. Um, and we never could have bought one of these units uh, I don't. I don't even know anyone. I'm a f retired physician, and I couldn't have bought any of the units that are going in now. Uh, so, in terms of increasing the opportunity for div diverse kinds of families or, or individuals to live in the units, is 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 more than defeated by by this. And the the, the again, the, the justification comes about because of the change in zoning codes. Uh, co uh, zone uh, code ordinances and uh, and to refer back to some hardship by having had a somewhat larger plot uh, in order to, to divide it into sub code plots uh, it is seems to me to be quite unfair. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Fletcher. Thank you. I'll ask uh, the applicant, Tyler Nogai, if he would like to say a few words as well. Please press star six to unmute, sir. Hi, thank you. This is Tyler Nogai, and thank you, Chair Goodman and the City Council for taking the time to hear about my project and my dream. Um, I've owned 3908 Abbott Avenue South for 17 years, since 2003. I've lived in Minneapolis since 2000, and uh, currently I own a quarter acre lot that's double the size of a typical city lot. Matter of fact, two of the uh, people that are appellant behind me, their lots are smaller than what my split's going to be. They're 5,901 square feet, so they're below that 6,000 square foot variance, and they both have three-story homes on this, which is rare in Minneapolis to have a three-story home, and they both have it. Um, so Minneapolis with a 240 plan, we do need more homes. And according to the Metropolitan Council, that there will be a 233,000 more households moving to Minneapolis in 2040. And we need more homes for all these people. And since 2010, 83,000 households have moved to Minneapolis, while only 64,000 new dwellings were built. Well, that makes a shortage already. So I decided to explore my property. 
and I've lived in this neighborhood for a long time. I'm seeking a minor subdivision at 5,350 and 5,348 square feet, and it's in the sphere of the neighborhood because all my neighbors behind me all have smaller lots than that. Square footage-wise, and the lot width is 40 feet. So they're smaller width and with both variances. And as we heard the expert, um, she did mention in the August 17th uh, the committee meeting that they're going to do away with the 6,000 minimum variance going forward with the 2040 plan. So in that sphere of the neighborhood, I feel like it's easy. It's a flat lot. It's a really easy minor subdivision. And we can have more family dwellings here. But before I went through this expense, the survey and the fees, I asked the senior planning, um, city planner, Lindsay Silas, and I asked her, uh, you know, do you think I can get a, do a minor subdivision here? What would you do? You're the expert. And Lindsay said, well, here, let me meet once a week with all the city planners. Let me mention it to the city planners, and then we'll meet up in like a week or 10 days. So we met up 10 days later. And she said all the city planners and experts agreed my property looked good to split with those two variances, one being smaller than the 6,000 square feet and one with a lot narrower than 50 feet. And the reason being is that there are 39 lots within a two block radius of mine that are 40 feet or less in width that are 5,100 or fewer square feet. So most of my neighborhood within two blocks are have all smaller lots than what my proposed lot is. So that, that is kind of in the spirit of what the neighborhood, neighborhood is. And the neighbors behind me, their lots are smaller in width and smaller in square footage than the two new proposed lots. So um, Lindsay and Mitch experts also mentioned that, you know, with the alley behind me, that's even better. And with the fact the lots are smaller all around you, behind you, and on your alley, a majority of them are, that this all fits in the spirit of the neighborhood. And as we, um, then on September 9th, we all got a postcard from the city of Minneapolis, where so went to all residents about the 2040 plan. It stated on January 1st, 2020, Minneapolis 2040 went into effect, along with the initial zoning changes, allowing up to three units on all residential prop properties. You know, this is clear, Minneapolis is growing and there's change and progress. Um, in Minneapolis, and we are, we're going to be short 233,000 minimum homes for the people that want to live here in Minneapolis. So what my plan was, was I've always dreamed of having an open format house for um, a family room and a large kitchen for family and friends to come over um, with and enjoy each other and to have a front porch. And on Abbott, the reason why I want a front porch is on Abbott, all of our neighbors, we all have kids. We all have, they all have front porches but me. And we're all outside in front of our houses. And so with people walking dogs, me and the neighbors and the kids playing, that's the sense of what community is all about. And that's why what I love about Minneapolis. Me and my kids and family have used it and have enjoyed it. And I'd like to build my home on one of the lots and build another family home on another lot. And currently I don't have exact building plans. That's a whole nother process because first things first, I need to get approval by you, by the council to split my lot first before I can go ahead and proceed with a, a contractor. Um, but with my neighborhood, it is in the spirit of the neighborhood. And we heard from Katie on Path and Lang and, and others here about two or three story luxury homes. And you now here are some facts about the neighborhood. Fact, Kate on um, Path and Lang, they do have a rare three story home. And I did upload it earlier today, so I don't know if you can see that. But two of the three neighbors both have three-story homes, which is very, very rare. And, you know, another fact is that Kate Lane's lot is smaller in width than all the city variances, and they're smaller in width than my, width, my proposed properties are, and smaller in square footage with a three-story home lot. So you can build a nice family home on the size of a lot. Back. There's no practical difficulties in accomplishing it, because obviously they both did it. They both have been looking there. Um, the fact is that Kate Catherine Lang and her husband moved into the neighborhood December of 2018. They haven't even been here two years yet. But I've been here a long time, and I've seen lots of changes in our neighborhood that Kate may not be aware of. There were two deserted lots across from me. It was really, really a nice park for my kids to play in and, and to, you know, to enjoy once in a while. Then two new neighbors arrived. 
and built two new single family homes. And we are great friends and all of our friends have played in our front yards for years. That is community in the neighborhood. So sometimes progress and change can have silver linings that we don't initially see or understand. But the fact is, another one is that Catherine Lang's house and one of the other appellates, their houses with the hill stand 50 to 60 feet over my house, above my house. And we heard from Kate today, and you know, it's, it's a little bit hypocritical. Mr. 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 Tyler, it's not yeah. helpful to be criticizing other people who spoke. I'm gonna ask you to try to wrap up the comments. It doesn't feel right to have you um, doing that. I understand, that's a good point. That's a good point. And it's just that, you know, I understand that with a three-story house, it's going to be blocking, uh, if we go two stories, which is all you'd be allowed to do, that maybe they don't have the view over everyone else. And I don't know if that's really what, what her intention was, but it seemed that way. And she doesn't like living out in the alley. But I don't believe that has to do with my minor subdivision. It's community. It's about enjoying all the neighbors here. And there's passage and there's silver linings with all that along with it. And on our alley, there are 20 or 22 households that have alley garages here. And another fact is that there are two duplexes, one on Beard and one in Abbott that do share the alley. And the duplex on Beard has been here before I was here in 2003. It's a part of the neighborhood, doesn't make it bad. And there's another duplex that's, that's on Abbott. And it's they all use the alley and we all help out. So. I believe that, you know, I do have a right to use the alley as well. But, you know, I also help out my neighbors. It's like my 85 Mr. Noah, can you center. please wrap up your comments? Okay, I'll wrap them up. So I hope that you will honor um, <clears throat> the 39 blocks. Uh, the, you know, the minor subdivision of my lot, there are 39 again that have a narrower width and a smaller square footage in a two block radius of my current home. And from what the experts have said, like at the Linen Hills, the Neighborhood Council Zoning and Housing Committee, August 10th, they unanimously voted for it. And one member on the Zoning Committee even mentioned that his lot was smaller than my proposed lot. Bjorn Olson wrote, the proposed subdivision is in the character of the adjacent blocks. The subdivision is reasonable and is not understood to cause any harm to adjacent property owners. The owners acted in good faith and intent the committee recommends that the city grant variances and proceed with the subdivision property. That is what the Linden Hills Community Neighborhood stated. And the experts on the 17th said the same thing, it is that with the City Planning Commission, we adopt the staff findings for the application. They voted to approve the minor subdivision because they know it's in the spirit of the neighborhood. And obviously, if there are homes right behind me on the alley, that have really nice size homes. Three Mr. Stories. Noiga, oh. I have asked okay. you three right. times to okay. conclude your comments. All right. Please do so now. You've okay. gone on now All for right. 10 minutes. All right. I thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your comments today. I'll ask the clerk if there are any additional members of the public who have called in in advance to speak to this item. Uh, no further speakers on item nine. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Clerk. I will then close the public hearing and see if any members of the committee uh, would like to chime in or make a motion. Seeing none, I am going to move then to grant the appeal. I do not believe practical difficulties actually exist unique to this lot. Uh, and I do believe that the very first part of this uh, variance process states that practical difficulties need to exist specifically as it pertains to this lot. And I don't find that to be the case. Others might disagree, um, but I am going to move to grant the appeal. Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman. I and, and appreciate that. I, I um, voted um, for the subdivision um, in Planning Commission. I plan on doing that. Um, after the hearing the developers um, testimony, I completely understand if my colleagues see no practical difficulty and not and going with and supporting your motion. I will say um, that city council, our powers are very, very limited when it comes to zoning. And I, I think it's important for people to understand that a lot of our job is to make sure that no matter what happens on a land, whatever a landowner who has the most property rights in this country decides to do, um, part of our job is to making sure we can all be neighbors afterward. 
And so I think a lot of this, when you're when you're talking about development, ideally this process helps you come to a, a some kind of compromise so that you can all live on the same block and we can all make the city what it, it is we want it to be. Um, so in, in that spirit, I hope that the developer um, is reaching out um, to the neighbors. I think they had some great suggestions on sustainability and affordability, and there is a lot of work when that can be done uh, to make sure that this development, um, as well as the people that decide to live there, can fit into the neighborhood. And I hope to see that from the developer. Thank you for your uh, very wise comments, Council Member Schrader. I felt that needed to be said, and I'm glad you did so. Is there anyone else who would like to comment on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Reich? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Osman? Aye. Allison? Aye. Schrader? No. Chair Goodman? Aye. There are five ayes, one nay. That motion passes. Seeing no further business before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you Madam all Chair, for participating. Uh, I apologize. This is City Attorney Bussey. I, I would ask that you also pass a direction to uh, uh, direct my office to prepare findings reflecting your most recent decision. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fussy. I'm sorry about that. I know better. <laughs> I will also ask the staff to direct uh, and prepare findings with regard to my main point that there is no practical difficulty to uh, in terms of granting this variance. And I guess uh, should you need a motion, I will make that as a motion and ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon? Aye. Osman? Aye. Allison? Aye. Schrader? Aye. Chair Goodman? Aye. There are six ayes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Now seeing no further business before us and without objection, I'll declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you all.